Today I got to fulfill a lifelong dream and interview my favorite author. Joyce Carol Oates and I had an excellent but quite a long discussion, so I think it's best if I segment our talk into three different videos. So in this first video, we talk mostly about Joyce Carol Oates' life as a reader, and then in the second video, we focus a bit more on her life as a writer, and then in the third video, we discuss her tremendous and extremely timely new novel, Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars. So I'll be releasing the, the next two videos over the coming days. And this interview was conducted over Zoom, so uh, the connection was a bit dodgy at some point, and, and at some point the video freezes. So I, I'm sorry about that. But Joyce Carol Oates is an icon, and she has so many interesting things to say. So I hope you enjoy this. How have you been in general for the, the past few months? Well, each day is its own challenge, I think. Now, my, mm. my life is not so different from what it would be because I live four miles outside Princeton. I live in a, in a semi-rural area on three acres of land, four miles outside Princeton. So I'm not like my friends in New York City who are really trapped in high-rise buildings. Yeah, in small apartments. And, yeah, and... yeah I, have, I have two friends who live like above the 30th floor in, in beautiful buildings. They haven't been out of their apartments since March 12th, literally. Wow. <laughs> they haven't been out. They're afraid to take the elevator. Mm. And they lit one of them is my editor, Dan Halpern. Yes. He hasn't seen, he hasn't seen a living actual person. <laughs> it's March 13th. And so by contrast, the life that I lead is pretty easy. I mean, I go outside in my garden and I see friends, some friends are coming over tonight, mm -hmm. sit about six or 10 feet apart. Right, yeah, sort of distanced walks together. Yeah. That's kind of what you do too, you go out. So yeah. Um, yeah, you're walking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this coming weekend we're planning on meeting some, some friends for a sort of distanced walk. Yeah, um, for... it's so much fun. Mm. I think it's a good place to do dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Much easier. And you, um, you have some relatively recently this year. You got some new cats, didn't you? Or some adopted some new kittens? Is that right? Yeah. Well, uh, Zanti is new since May two thousand nineteen. I mm -hmm. mean, she's relatively new in my life. She's younger. She's a smoke calico. That's a calico cat underneath with kind of gray and silver on top. <laughs> wow! Beautiful. Um, and I've seen from Twitter that you've been uh, rereading uh, War and Peace over, over the past few months while you've been at home. Um, what inspired you to, to read that again? Well, my friend Yi Young Lee, Yi oh. Young Lee, who's at the university, she's my I love her writing. Yeah. She, I think she's sort of the organizer of a book club for a public place, it's called. It's a magazine, a nonprofit located in New York City. And they, they sponsored um, like a, an online reading of this novel. And it's, it was a good choice, I think. Hmm. It's, not, it's not a novel I would particularly recommend for 2020 because hmm. Tolstoy is extremely conservative and he puts us all in the same old categories. <laughs> you know, he talks about intelligent women, but real women. Now the real women are the ones he likes and the intelligent women are the ones who ask questions and so forth. So it's, it's sort of an old fashioned patriarchal conservatism. I mean, we wouldn't even want to know what he thinks about gay culture. Like, right. You know, <laughs> it's just so, um, but it was a good choice in the sense that it, there are lots of good parts to it. Mm. It's not anything I would have chosen, but it was fun to do. Mm -hmm. And as a lifelong teacher and professor, um, you've obviously reread a lot of classic fiction many times while teaching it to, to students. Are there particular stories or novels which stand out to you as offering new insights no matter how many times you read them? Oh, that's true for most of the classics, I think. And it's true, I suppose, for Tolstoy mm. also. When I teach, I often use my own anthologies because I've assembled the short stories and, and work that I, that I particularly value. So I've taught many things many, many times. And with each set of students, there are new responses and kind of new excitement generated. 
But I taught a new course this past semester at Princeton called The American Dream. Hmm. And I can even send you the syllabus if you're interested. Oh, so yeah. we started off reading the Declaration of Independence hmm. and looking at the text of Jefferson's prose. And these beautifully uh, 18th century elegantly stacked layered sentences, which are so beautiful to read. Then the students had an exercise where they wrote, they wrote a paragraph in Jeffersonian prose, and it was really good. It was good exercise for them. Oh, that's lovely. And, and then we, we, we looked at Walt Whitman's Song of Myself at considerable length with Van Winkle, right up to through the black writers like Ralph Ellison, through to Jumper Lahiri and Juno Diaz, who are writing as the children of immigrants to the United States. So it's kind of a sweeping look at American culture, the American dream, hmm. with lots of other things. I mean, we've spent time on Faulkner and Flannery O'Connor and so mm -hmm. forth. So that was a new emphasis on the idea of the American dream. At least half the students, or maybe more, were second generation immigrant families. And they um, had a particular perspective on the American dream, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Then I had some, I had biracial students. One student, so interestingly, on one side of his family, there were slaves, and the other side of his family was slaveholders. He was mm -hmm. biracial, mm -hmm. and he descended from, um, I don't know which, could have been Virginia, but he sort of encompassed the American dream on both sides. Yeah, he must have given such an interesting point of view. Um, yeah, he was a brilliant yeah. student, too. Yeah. Um, and so, like with writers like, like Tolstoy, where um, you, you said that you, know, you might notice a, a more sexist point of view than you initially realized or remembered from when you might have read it. And um, I think there's a lot of authors um, we read like that, a lot of classic authors. Um, so how do you think we as readers should deal with books from the past which contain antiquated attitudes and language uh, regarding gender and race and sexuality? And well, any, any novel from the past is, is likely to be, like I'm, re, I'm rereading The Idiot and I'm mm -hmm. finding surprising things in The Idiot, but I was also rereading or sort of looking at Lady Chatterley's Lover, which I had taught. Mm. I've never taught The Idiot. I've taught about the brothers Karamazov, the possessed, and crime and punishment. So I know those texts really well, but, but the idiot I've only read, the surprising things I didn't remember in the idiot. And Lady Chatterley, of course, like all of D.H. Lawrence, he's such a strong personality on the page, you know. He's the sort of person who came into a room, he would be provocative, some people would hate him, but some people would admire him. If you're reading in the past, you should certainly have an open mind. If you're a woman and you're hypersensitive about misogyny and sexism, you basically could read about 2% of the world's literature. <laughs> I mean, there would almost be nothing you could look at. You know, so um, Faulkner, too, our, his presentation of black people, while in some ways it's very commendable, in other ways it could be considered today somewhat caricature. Mm -hmm. you know, so even though at his time it was extraordinarily sensitive and empathetic with black people. Today, a black reader might just be kind of alienated by some of the things that he says. Mm -hmm. However, um, I'm, I'm not a judgmental person. As you can tell from my writing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of sympathy for characters. Like, I really loved all the characters in the McLaren family in Night, Sleep, Death of the Stars. I mm -hmm. mean, all of, all of the, the children, kind of bickering with one another, Beverly and her sister and the brothers, and Tom throws Virgil down and they're sort of scrap. I mean, it's like they revert to childhood. And yeah, and it, It's so touching and tender that people are so, so human. Hmm. And have yeah, many flaws, obviously, as well as strengths hmm. to, to their I personality. Think with, a, with a, some of our flaws, but sometimes we love one another for our flaws. You know, we're not perfect. Hmm. Absolutely. And I'm um, sort of looking on the, the opposite side, uh, you know, given the, the widespread protests in response to George Floyd's death. Um, I know a lot of readers are looking for literature that can help us better understand 
racism, prejudice, and the historical reasons for why society is in this position. Um, and uh, you know, and I, I think your um, your novel has a really interesting perspective on on that on those issues. Um, and I, I want to discuss that more with you. Um, but first, I'm curious, uh, what books you've read by other authors which are particularly illuminating on these subjects, whether it's in fiction or nonfiction, um, that really like, brought in your uh, understanding of, of the, um, I guess, the workings of prejudice and racism? Oh, I, I don't even know where I would begin with that. That's sort of overwhelming. We have yeah. some very wonderful Black poets at yeah. the present time. Um, yeah, Terence Hayes is so good. I think James McBride. I'd have to really sort of look at the names. Uh, mm. Natasha Trethaway is, is wonderful. Rita Dove, of course. Um, and of course, my former colleague and friend, Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. If you read any, anything of Toni, Toni Morrison, it takes you right into that world. Terry McMillan was one of the first black woman writers to be commercially successful. She wrote a novel called Mama many years ago. I remember Terry and I were both living in Michigan. And I had met her, and um, Terry McMillan represents um, an accessible black world that's realistic and not only literary or experimental. Whereas Toni Morrison is a poetic writer; she's a very beautiful writer. For Toni Morrison, the sentence is very elegant. It's very important that she gets the sentences quite right. So she's more of a <clears throat> A formalist, I think, than many writers who who deal with race racial issues. Mm. So the, these writers are all very different. John Edgar Wideman, another friend of mine, is not obviously, I think, to himself a difficult writer, but in fact, his writing is difficult. It's very intense and very focused. And John can write about life in Pittsburgh in in the twentieth century or he could write about a historic subject he could write about uh, he could write a memoir about his own brother who is in prison for life and his own son who is in prison i think also for life so and then john himself is is a really intellectual he teaches at brown university he has written about the philadelphia black organization called move m-o-v-e um, John Edgar Wideman is a very wide ranging black writer. Mm. And of course, the classics like uh, Native, Native Son, Richard Wright, it's probably the beginning of a breakthrough black writer. R Native Son was a, a book of the month club selection when it was published, which is extraordinary. Mm. So it became like a big bestseller, even though it's a very, very painful novel for white people to read. Mm. All of these, I think, in the aggregate would certainly give you. Oh, the Lilith has come in, so maybe in a minute I'll try to get over here. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> it could say hello. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, considering how regularly um, new books of yours are published, I think a lot of people are surprised by how much you read as well. I mean, you're also a book reviewer and have published several books of nonfiction, um, examining and meditating on both great works of literature and contemporary fiction. And you write many blurbs for new books as well. Like for instance, recently I read Claire Beam's excellent debut novel, The Illness yeah. Lesson, um, partly because you you recommended it so strongly. Um, Excuse me, she was my student. Oh, also. she was. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. She's a very good writer, but her short stories, I think, are just as good or even better. Ah, okay. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, um, yeah, that she'll have a short story collection then at, at some point, too. Um, but I was wondering, do you, do you find it challenging to read other people's novels when you're immersed in the creation of your own stories? Because I know some writers um, stop reading anyone else's books when they're working on their own projects. Well, reading other people's writing is the easy part or the enjoyable part. And this is a very, I don't know whether you know the work of Norman La. Oh, no, I don't. He's got a whole series of these American novels, a series of um, the American novels series. Emerson and Throw in it, as Edgar Allan Poe, Elizabeth Cady and Susan Anthony are in this novel. James, he, 
he wrote about these famous people from the point of view of people like their secretaries or somebody who knows them, you know, mm. and they're really delightful. He has a nice, he has a good reputation and yet he's not, he's not known, you know, he's, mm. he's respected. He always gets good reviews, but his writing is somehow not, not known. Mm. So I would recommend you, this is called American Follies. But, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll seek him out. No, the, but... My own reading is the easy. Yeah, Norman Locke, L-O-C-K. Mm -hmm. But uh, the easy the question is, the reading is the easy part of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to do that later on in the day. As you can see, I have these books right here. So I might, if I have a snag in my own writing, I might just sneak 10 minutes of reading Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. As a kind of reward or maybe like, yeah, a... Um... A, a pleasurable divergence from yeah, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and back when I was studying at the University of East Anglia I read your novel uh, Mysteries of Winterthorn um, for oh. the first time and it was a complete revelation to me I mean after I finished it I thought I didn't know fiction could do that you know that <laughs> sort of feeling of reading something that shows you how much you can do with language and form um, but are there particular novels or authors you've read who've given you this similar feeling of about the expansive possibilities of what the novel can do? Almost every novel that I can remember of any distinction did make some impression on me. I've spoken a lot about Alice in Wonderland and Alice in the Looking Glass, so obviously that was the great, you know, the great uh, inspiration of my life when I was about eight or nine years old. Hmm. Kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> Another constant interruption is the cats of my study. <laughs> and she's very jealous that I'm paying attention to you, and so she's knocking things down. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> she's just very jealous. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's jealous of you. <laughs> The tension is supposed to be on her, not you. Mm -hmm. She has no idea why I'm so interested in this little square, this little rectangle on my desk. So. <laughs> and I'm sure once you stop talking to me and try to pay attention to her, she'll run away. So. She'll run away. Do you have a pet there? Um, I don't, no. Um, Do you have a dog or cat? No, no I, I don't have either. Although I've had friends who have um, adopted puppies during this time of, of lockdown, because it's, a, it's yeah. a good time to sort of train new dogs and <laughs> now yeah, that you have lots of yeah. time at home. Well, puppy is maybe a lot of a lot of work. Mm. Cats are not much work. So um, you asked the question, yes, probably about eight or 10 writers made an enormous impression on me. I mean, I could talk about any one of them for a long, for a long time. Uh, yeah, but when I was about four, when I was 14 or so, I think I discovered Henry David Thoreau oh. made a strong impression on me, I've, I've thought Thoreau and he means a good deal to me. Then the, the largest impression in terms of writing was I was about 15 and I discovered the early stories of Ernest Hemingway, emulating him, writing stories in Hemingway style of in our time. That was very important. And I asked my students to do that too. We spent some time on the early stories of Hemingway. Hmm. The very skeletal minimalist beautiful stories, quite remarkable, like prose poems. Mm. And then I discovered Faulkner around the same time. So those writers made an enormous impression on me. I, uh, I mentioned before that, um, that here on YouTube, a lot of readers enjoy sharing their most treasured books and books that mean a lot to them, uh, not just because of their content, but because they're a personal copy that has special sentimental value or is a limited edition or, you know, some sort of very special um, copy just for them. Um, so do you, do you have some books you'd like to share from your personal library? Yeah, I'll go and see if I can find, and I should be able to find it easily my copy of Alice in Wonderland that my grandmother gave to me when I was about eight or nine years old. So this is my, this is the great novel, or two novels of my, of my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I have other books that are sort of filed in different parts of the house. But anyway, this is, this is the original copy. And it's so old. <laughs> I mean, it's, 
I think it's like 1946. Oh, it's beautiful old illustrations. So you're the copy that my grandmother gave me. So wow. I had more or less memorized all of this. This <laughs> is like, this is so important to me. The Mad Tea Party. Uh, for a little farm girl in upstate New York to be reading about these Brits, British people behaving very weirdly. <laughs> and Alice, of course, is a little British girl. Mm -hmm. Down the rabbit hole. Jabberwocky was my favorite poem. Hmm. There are a lot of people for whom Jabberwocky makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm not so surprised about the absurdity of life as some people are, because it's all here, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, Humpty Dumpty, <laughs> the pomposity of Humpty Dumpty, the madness of the Red Queen, the naivete of the White Knight, the lobster quadrille, the mock turtle, and you know, the the duchess with her pepper and so uh, forth. Yes. <laughs> and Alice with her long neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people in our real life that we can think of as parallels to some of these, you know, um, larger than life yeah. characters and did I ever did I ever show you that there's an artist who did a, a drawing of me like Alice? Oh, I've seen I've seen a reproduction of that a, a photo of that yeah. online before, but I have that over here. So oh yes, I, I, I hope you can come visit my house sometime. That would be uh, wonderful. <laughs> anyway, it's not very flattering. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> It is kind of wonderful. <laughs> and the artist is a woman named da Dallas Kiorowski. Mm -hmm. And she really understood my connection with, with Alice. She's done some, uh, some work based on Alice in Wonderland herself. I think there's a famous cadre of people who read his, his other work too. Mm -hmm. The Hunting of the Snark is, is very wonderful. <laughs> Well, yes, I, I'm sure I could spend hours and hours looking around your bookshelves and, and all of your different yeah, treasures yeah. and like... <laughs> yeah, the American literature is downstairs, so I'd have to go down there. But I have some very wonderful things there <laughs> also. That's great. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Um, and I, I know at university you studied philosophy and a lot of your fiction contains many different philosophical concepts and ideas. Um, do you still read philosophy as well? And did you ever, back when you were at university, consider um, teaching philosophy or becoming a philosopher yourself? No, it, philosophy is, is, too, <clears throat> is too detached from the life, from the life of, the, of the actual mind. It's too rarefied. Mm. The, the, I think the major flaw in philosophy as a discipline is assuming a uniformity of the human mind that doesn't exist. Like Descartes and Aristotle and, and nearly all the philosophers, Schopenhauer, they seem to be addressing a mind, but there is nothing, there is nothing like that in the world. There are brains containing personalities and experiences, the mm. personalities that are all very different. Mm. And I think that we, when we confront literature, we see the profound difference between, well, Hamlet, the character of Hamlet, and the character of King Lear, the character of Macbeth, the mm. character of Othello and Iago. They're very distinctly imagined personalities that Shakespeare has evoked. And that you could abstract a mind from these characters is is actually sort of problematic. I know renowned philosophers personally who teach at Princeton. They are highly regarded. However, they are people who inhabit bodies. They have families. They're emotional. Some of them are not totally physically well. They ha they have problems. They're their, the essence of their mind is sort of a fiction. That's kind of a meta mm. philosophical position that I'm, that I'm presenting. Mm -hmm. So if you're a writer like D.H. Lawrence, you want to approach life in the scrimmage and the thick of things. That's what Lawrence said. Mm. He wanted to take life into its sensuous reality. So life is, it's really matter of mercurial moods. My, my critique of philosophy is that 
if you look upon philosophy, like the, the great work of Nietzsche as the expression of a, of a literary consciousness, mm -hmm. then uh, Spinoza is also very, very beautiful and wonderful. And the dialogues of Plato are very interesting. Those are little dramas. But philosophy in itself is just like a large tent with all these really outsized and interesting personalities of whom uh, Nietzsche is very, very profound. I think I understand intuitively Nietzsche is sort of in a poetic way. Mm. But, to, but to think that you can get a, a, a reading of reality from the philosophers is an outmoded idea. People did think that in the, in the ancient world, and they did think that maybe in the medieval world. Today, if you want to have some sense of, of human life and destiny and what makes up the human psyche, you would go into a cog a cognitive psychology and neuroscience, um, neuroscience of a more humanistic type. So, you don't, read, you don't need a philosopher sitting in an armchair trying to figure out the human brain. Mm -hmm. You can actually study the human brain. And that's why you're more drawn to, to reading fiction, because it engages with all that, the complexities right. of personalities in a, in a way. Yeah. That's right. Well, there, I don't think there, as I said, I don't think there's any perspective to talk about the mind mm -hmm. of man. There never was such an an entity. Descartes is writing about something that's a fiction. He's sort of writing about his own, his own mind, but he's pretending that he doesn't have a whole family around him. He has a servant girl who's taking care of his, his dirty linen. Somebody's bringing him his food. He's affluent. He doesn't have to worry about being poor. Uh, there, there are many, many things that philosophy doesn't even acknowledge exists. A good novelist like James Joyce tries to take in as much of the world as he can. And all novelists leave a lot out too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you, not, you don't find all of life in, in, Jane, in Jane Austen. You don't hear about Jane Austen's relatives mm -hmm. who, who died horribly in childbirth. And you don't hear about servant girls being raped in Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. Things that were going on all the time. So novels, too, don't take in all of the world. Mm. But, but I did minor in philosophy, and I love to read philosophy. Mm. I often read Pascal. If I can't sleep at night, there are books that I reach for, and certainly Pascal is one of them. And my, my book blog is called Lonesome Reader, and I was inspired to call it that um, because of your short story collection, uh, High Lonesome, um, which, uh, incidentally, I think is one of the most beautiful covers oh. of, of all of your books. So I didn't realize that Lonesome, Lonesome Reader is such a nice <laughs> kind of melancholy title. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, I'm, but I, I sort of called it that because I, I mean obviously I love reading but I've always grappled with this per perplexing emotional state that reading evokes you know this kind of melancholy loneliness paired with a wondrous connection with humanity and I know you've written about the distinction between loneliness and aloneness before, um, but I was wondering if you could speak about these states of being in relation to the reading life. Well, I think that many writers are writing to assuage loneliness. And if, you, if you're missing your family or don't have a family, there's not, nothing so familial as the novel. You create your novel and create your own family and immerse yourself in it. So George Santayana said religion is another world to live in. And so the novel for the novelist is another world to live in. It can be very comforting. and It can be uh, confining in a good way. It sort of limits the parameters of your emotional experience in, in a positive way. But we don't, most of us don't know what real loneliness is. Like it would be like, being in solitary confinement and not able to see anyone else would be devastating to the human brain. It's mm. a terrible, terrible punishment. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's really beautifully and poignantly put. Thank you.